Welcome everyone to Emotional Intelligence. My name is Stacy Hartman. I'm with Deb Hagenmo. We both work in the DLMP Education Office based in Rochester, and we focus on allied health staff education. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have you with us today. So I'd like to start by telling you what the objectives are for today's session. And it makes sense that we should define what emotional intelligence is first. And then we're going to explain what the four competencies of emotional intelligence are, and then finish up with, okay, now that I know what it is, how do I do it? What are some strategies to help me build my emotional intelligence? So I'm gonna start with the definition. And emotional intelligence is defined as the ability to understand, use, and manage your emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, overcome challenges, and diffuse conflict. Hey, Stacy, this sounds fabulous. Sign me up, right? For sure. Yeah, well, then, then there's that old grumpy skeptic in me that says, yeah, yeah, sure. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. So I thought, okay, who might be a real person that exemplifies the uh, competencies associated with high emotional intelligence? Did not have the pleasure of meeting her personally, but I've read a bit about Sister Generals and heard other people speak of her so very highly. And I came to the conclusion she likely had very high emotional intelligence. So now I've got a real person that can be my role model that I can try to emulate as I seek to improve my emotional intelligence. Word of caution, emotional intelligence is not charisma or gregariousness. It's not something that either you got it or you don't. It's a skill, which means any of us can learn it. Second caveat, this presentation isn't the magic bullet. Ah, it's in my learning, I have attended, I am now able. Like anything else, awareness is one thing, but to actually practice it is gonna take some practice. So we're going to provide you with some strategies today, and we're also gonna send you some resources that you can use to help build your emotional intelligence. Well, hopefully this is good news. You know it, that, yes, it means there's work we have to do, but, but there's hope for all of us. Even if we're starting with a low emotional intelligence, we can all improve. So I take this as good news and not just another to do. Good point, Stacy. It's regardless of where you are in the continuum as you self-assess, there's opportunities. No matter how high your emotional intelligence is, you can still raise that bar. So now you know what it is, we've defined it, but it's gonna take work. Is it worth it? I guess that's for you to decide. Emotional intelligence is linked to better work performance. Think about it. You might know somebody who's really strong in their technical skills, but when they get placed in a leadership role, they struggle because they don't have good relationship building skills. According to the research of Drs. Bradbury and Greaves, emotional intelligence accounts for 58% of your performance, regardless of what your job is. You know, very few of us do jobs in isolation. We have to interact with one another, even if we're remote. So that ability to maintain those positive relationships with others does have an impact on the quality of our work. Another reason, 90% of high performers also have high emotional intelligence. They have that ability to influence others, manage those emotions, and have very positive relationships. Higher emotional intelligence can also make you a better leader if that's one of your goals. This is according to the research of Dr. Daniel Goldman. He found that emotional competencies make up at least 80% of the distinguishing competencies of outstanding leaders. And finally, little bottom line, people with high EI often make more money. This is Drs. Bradbury's and Greaves model for emotional intelligence. They break it into four competencies and they build off of one another. It starts with you. So my personal competence is my awareness, of my emotions, and then how do I manage them? I love it, 
two good action words, aware and manage. And this, the other two competencies involve others, social competence. Am I aware of your emotions and perspectives and how do I manage our relationships in a positive manner? So I've defined it. I've, I've explained to you what those four competencies are. Now I'm gonna do a little bit of a biology lesson on how those emotions get generated and how they impact what we call our three brains. The first is we have a reptile brain, which is composed of your thalamus and your brainstem. It's located here at the base of your skull and it connects to your spinal cord. Our reptile brain is responsible for keeping us safe, for identifying and responding to perceived threats. That's where we get our fight or flight response from. The second brain is our limbic system. All that sensory information from your fingers, your toes, wherever goes through the spinal cord, up through our reptile brain into the limbic system. That's where emotions come from. That's where they're produced. I was surprised to learn that our brains are hardwired to give an emotional response first before that sensory information goes from there to our frontal cortex, which is our rational brain. This is where our higher level thinking happens so that we can make decisions, understand the consequences and gain some perspective. When we're feeling stressed, the reptile brain takes control. It sees a threat because our limbic system says, you know, I'm anxious, I'm afraid, I'm whatever. So when we engage that reptile brain, we're likely to say or do something that we'd later regret because we hadn't thought it through. So if we start increasing our self-awareness of our emotions and start regulating our thoughts, we can have that opportunity to pause for a moment and engage the frontal cortex, our rational brain, and consider the consequences before we say or do something. So let's get started. Let's dive into each of these domains. So the first domain that Deb mentioned is self-awareness. Self-awareness is critically important for emotional intelligence. It's the foundation. I can't effectively manage my emotions, much less manage my relationships with other people if I'm not aware of myself. So self-awareness is the things that make us tick. You know, where are we strong? Where are we not as strong? What are stressful triggers for us? What motivates us? Things like that. That's our self-awareness. Um, we'll dive into these a little bit further, but I just want to reiterate that some of us are much more in tune with our thoughts and feelings than others. I am not teaching this class because I'm an expert in emotional intelligence. I'm teaching this class because I want to learn more about it. So if you're in that same boat and you're thinking like, oh my gosh, this is brand new to me and I'm just getting started, you're in the right class. If you've already been working on your EI and you're just here to you know, motivate yourself to kind of work on it a little bit further, you're also in the right class. Hopefully wherever you're at, you can work to improve and myself very much included in that. All right, so let's think about self-awareness. We said we can improve no matter where we're at. So if we're working on self-awareness, what are some of the things we can do to improve our self-awareness? You also have these strategies listed in your handout and I'll encourage you a couple of times during this talk today that we hope that this isn't just a one and done, but you're going to pick one of the four competencies of EI and pick one or more strategies that you're going to try for the next month to improve that area of your EI. So there's the challenge for all of us. So self-awareness, we can spend some time thinking about our strengths. And if you're like me, the last time you did this was when you were preparing for an interview. <laughs> you're getting ready for that interview and so you listed out your strengths. You could make sure to tell that to the hiring manager. But do we ever stop to think about our strengths when we're not applying for a job? You know, I haven't applied for a job for two or three years. Have I stopped to think about my strengths or why should I? Uh, the idea is if we spend some time thinking about where we're strong, if they're at the front of our mind, we can then leverage them to their best advantage. We can make sure that we are using our strengths optimally. On the flip side of strengths, you could think about our weaknesses or areas of development, I call it. It doesn't have to be an area you're weak. It just is any area that you want to grow stronger. Think about those areas. Where would you like to grow? 
Another thing we could do to work on our self-awareness is to look for ripple effects. You know, we're all going to have an emotional outburst occasionally, right? Um, you can pause, reflect back on that and look at how did this outburst affect you? How did it affect those around you? And then you can maybe do some assessment to think about what some alternative actions might have been. And then lastly on this list is observing your triggers or identifying your triggers, I should say. What's the situation that triggers a strong emotion in you? So for me, if I'm driving on Interstate 494 at 5 p.m., that is going to be a stressful situation for me, right? Like I'm gonna have very little patience. Um, I'm gonna trip very easily into to stress or into anger if I'm in a lot of traffic. So knowing that traffic is a trigger for me, identifying that, being self-aware, I can then work with managing it. You know, I can try not to drive through the cities at rush hour, or if I have to, I can um, make sure that I'm not going to have a difficult conversation with that person in my car at that time, because I know I'm going to be stressed and not at my best. So yeah, we spent, I don't know, a minute, maybe probably two minutes total, given that half of it was directions, but we spent maybe a minute thinking about what some of our triggers are. So if we could come up with triggers pretty quickly, um, just think if you spent a little bit longer time reflecting on this for yourself, you could come up with a pretty comprehensive list of triggers. Um, and by identifying your triggers, again, then you can work toward oh, how am I going to manage these triggers? So identifying triggers is not the only thing we can do to work on our self-awareness. We can also look for our blind spots. So what do I mean by blind spots? Let's say passion is one of your strengths. On one side of that coin, passion is good. It gives us that fire in our bellies to go after what we want to go after and to fight for the causes we believe in. The other side of that coin, it probably means we have strong opinions, which might, might be fine unless they're used as a weapon. You know, are those strong opinions used to silence the other voices in the room? Because I'm so passionate, I'm just not gonna hear other people's opinions. I'm gonna tell them what they should think. <laughs> so to identify our own blind spots, that's pretty tricky. We're biased, right? We see our own view of things. So if we want to work on this, we probably need to solicit help from someone we trust. So you'd have to ask for feedback from someone you trust to help you identify your blind spots. Um, and you're gonna have to find someone who's going to be honest with you. So someone who knows you fairly well, who's also willing to be honest with you. Um, they're, they're willing to give you feedback without just candy coating it or sugar coating it and just telling you the positives. So if you want valid feedback, make sure you ask the right way. So put it into context. You know, I'm asking you because I trust you to give me an honest assessment and I value your opinions and I'm working to develop my skills. So I would like some input on where I'm strong and areas that I need to work on as well. I'm let you know that you value their opinion. You know, tell them why you're asking them, that you trust them, et cetera. Um, and acknowledge that yes, you do have areas to be developed, but, but you need outside input as well to identify all those areas and to identify potential blind spots. Then when they come back to you with the feedback, make sure you listen to it and receive that feedback gracefully. Um, don't argue with them and don't offer your own feedback of them unless they ask for it. You know, you ask for this feedback, so receive it gracefully and really do appreciate them. It wasn't easy for them to give you this feedback, most likely. No one likes to give anybody constructive feedback, much less probably a good friend of theirs. So make sure you take it gracefully and thank them. And then you could also set it up for, you know, would it be okay if I ask again in the future for feedback? Feel free to ask that as well. All right, one more potential thing we could do when we're working on self-awareness is identifying our emotions. So before we can go into managing our emotions, we must identify what they are. Emotional intelligence isn't about pretending we're happy all the time. I'm gonna say that again, it's not about pretending we're happy all the time. We all experience a range of emotions. Obviously these are just a few of them, but we experience a range of emotions and we experience them to different degrees at different times. If we're choosing to identify our emotions, we're going to keep a log of when it is, what was going on, and what we're feeling. And we'll keep a real objective, like what our emotion is. We're not going to say it's a good emotion or a bad emotion. It's just, I was happy. I was upset. Whatever it is, just label the emotion for what it is. 
We're not gonna categorize them as good or bad. Emotions aren't good or bad. They're our reaction to the world around us. So the idea is if we can identify and understand our emotions, we can stop from acting without thinking. So we're tying that emotional brain in with our logical brain to make sure that we have sound actions. So I know some of the people on this call are not new to this topic. Has anybody tried this strategy of labeling their emotions? And if so, are, anybody wanna shout out and share their experience with this technique? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so I, I will say I have an example. I wasn't specifically um, I wasn't specifically doing this where I was like, taking a week and labeling all my emotions. Um, however, I did have one situation where I actually kind of stepped back and thought about, well, what am I actually feeling? So it was somewhat early in the pandemic and I was driving on North Broadway in Rochester and a car in front of me took an illegal turn and almost crashed into oncoming traffic because they shouldn't have been turning at that time. <laughs> and I shouted out at this driver. Granted, my windows are shut. I'm in a car by myself. However, I shouted out very angrily at this driver and I'm not like a hair trigger shouting out sort of a person typically, which caught me off guard because that's not me. So I kind of stepped back and thought, am I actually angry? Am I truly angry at this driver? Like I'm yelling at this driver as if I'm angry. Am I truly angry? And when I stepped back to think about it, I realized I wasn't actually angry. I was just feeling very uh, tense. You know, the, the whole uncertainty of the pandemic was wearing on me, I was feeling very anxious and that anxiety came out as anger. I say that just to show that if we take some time to identify our emotions, we might be surprised sometimes that what we thought we were feeling wasn't actually what we were feeling. And once we identify that emotion, we can then um, kind of go into the next steps and work to figure out like what was the root cause and how will I handle this? Which leads us directly into the next competence. It leads us from self-awareness into self-management. Thank you, Stacy. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist, philosopher, author, and he was a Holocaust survivor. He's most known for his book, Man's Search for Meaning, which described his experience as uh, in a concentration camp. And when I read this quote, this really resonated for me. I felt absolutely empowered by what I read. I was so excited. And the reason being is I am known by people who know me well. I'm one of those folks that wears her heart on her sleeve. And I have had performance appraisals where that's been brought up. And of course, being defensive, that's how I am. I'm just me. And I felt like I was powerless to do anything about it. Take me or leave me. And that has been one of the most probably uh, worthwhile steps on my journey to improve my emotional intelligence. When I realized I don't have to be a victim of this is just how I am. I can learn a skill to do better. And so what I have found is a strategy that works for me when I'm feeling those strong emotions. I need to pause. And like Stacy said, recognize, here's a trigger, here's a, yeah, I'm, I'm going to lose control or I might say something I shouldn't. And so I've either said, I, I need a minute, you know, and just kind of pause, take a breath. Or I've also said, I need some time to reflect on this. And can we talk about this more later so that I have that opportunity so I don't engage my reptile brain and get in trouble. So Stacy talked about our emotions, and one of the best ways to manage our emotions is to manage our stress. And I know everybody's kind of in a chronic stress state these days. But remember, when we're feeling really stressed, that's engaging that reptile brain, and maybe that's why sometimes, you know, uh, we're saying things maybe just a bit too quickly. So when we take care of ourselves and manage our stress, we're going to have probably less situations where we have that moment of regret. You're probably familiar with most of the strategies that are listed on this slide, and I'm not going to spend time on them. I just want to highlight one of them, socializing. Research has shown that positive relationships 
provides you with that support that you need when you need it. And with many of us working remotely, I've really found that it's hard to stay connected sometimes, but it truly is worth it. By having even those Zoom meetings or, or Teams or Skype or whatever it is, just connecting by voice at least, rather than just the email, that extra effort is really worth it. I agree. I think if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's taught us that socialization is important to all of us, for sure. Yeah. The next strategy I want to talk about, and again, this is one I'm totally guilty of, is I, I create little stories in my head rather than ask people for clarification on things. And I'll give you a little example. Let's say I walk into a room and there's three of my staff and they all have furrowed brows. And I look over at Stacy and go, uh-oh, Stacy's mad at me. Oh, what did I do? Oh, I guess I'll avoid her for right now because I'm, I'm, I am I'm, must have done something. I don't know what, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait till she's smiling again. But then I look over at Mark and he's got a furrowed brow. Oh, Mark, you must be having a tough day. And I'll, I'll, I'll go, hey, you all right? He's probably thinking, hmm? And then finally, I look over at Jeremy. He's got the same furrow brow going on. Oh, well, that's Jeremy. He's kind of an introvert. He's probably just doing his thing. Now, wouldn't it have made a lot more sense rather than listening to the little voice in my head to say, hey, good morning. How's everybody doing? Pretty simple thing to do. Or when you're having in the midst of that conversation and, and things start to go off the rails, don't just assume you know what's going on. Ask for some clarification. Another strategy we can use to manage our emotions is to practice positivity. Positive emotions make a difference. When you're feeling relaxed and calm, you're more creative. And it also kind of expands your perspective of things. You think more clearly. In general, if you're one of those folks that have positive emotions, you'll find that you bounce back quicker than someone who tends to be the curmudgeon. And remember that emotions are also contagious. You, we've all seen it. Things are kind of happy in the workplace and someone comes in with the crabby face. Zoom, morale can just change on a dime. So the strategy I wanna offer you is to smile more. And that's really hard with masks on. I always used to love to walk down the subway and smile at the patients. You know, didn't know, it was my personal goal to see how many smiles I could get. Well, it's a little tough to do now, but I still smile through my mask. And we're going to do an experiment. See if, see if this works for you. Put a frown on your face. Yeah, crunch up. What just happened? I pulled into myself. My shoulders went up. I got all tense. And I kind of got an icky feeling in my stomach. It wasn't very pleasant. No, I don't want to do that. Flip it around. Smile. Not a fake, you want a real one. Now look at posture. I'm more relaxed and I got a little butterfly in my tummy, maybe an endorphin being released. So that simple act of smiling, our reptile brain says, hmm, you're happy. You know, uh, that means I'm gonna give it a little boost. So don't forget the simple things like laughing and smiling more. That's a great strategy, but sometimes things don't go as we had planned. And it's really tempting, and I've been guilty of this. I wrap myself up in the big quilt of, well, I didn't mean to. That wasn't my intention. And I think that gets me off the hook because it wasn't my intention. Well, the reality is, is the impact of your words and actions is more important than your intentions. So when you make a mistake or a misstep, and it's bound to happen, even though that wasn't your intent, that person received that message that way, take some time to reflect on that situation and think about what was my role in that outcome. It's not all on them. Well, it's their fault that they interpret it. That wasn't my intention. And if you need to apologize or make amends, do it. And then take the opportunity to think, what could I do differently next time so it doesn't happen again, so that you can learn from that experience? 
Reflection is a term we often as educators use. It's a teaching strategy to help people learn information. And some of you might not be as familiar with reflection. So I want to take just a moment to talk about it. And I've provided a little graphic of, so how do you walk through a reflective process? First, you find some place quiet where you've got a moment to think. And then try to be as objective as we can. We know we have biases, but think, how would you describe the situation to someone? How are you feeling? And again, getting in touch with your emotions and why you felt that way. Were you just telling a little story in your head and making some assumptions? Could there be something else going on that that person reacted the way they did? You know, what, what, if the roles were, were reversed, how might you be feeling then? And again, what can I learn from that experience? Reflection is a hugely valuable tool. And it's something that I've been trying to practice at least once a day. It's my early morning routine. Before I log into the computer, I just sit down quietly for a couple minutes and reflect. You know, how did I do yesterday? What could I do better? Yeah, I'll echo Deb's thoughts there. Prior to coming to the education office, I hadn't been using reflection very much, uh, but now I'm a firm believer in it. It's a great way to learn whether it's learning facts and you just pause every once in a while and think about what did I just read and how will I use this and how does it tie into what I already know, or whether it's to reflect back on experiences like Deb is talking here. Um, Dr. Corder, who's in transfusion medicine, likes to say, we don't learn from experiences, we learn by reflecting on those experiences. Yeah, thank you, Stacy. I, I agree. So if we want to improve our self-management, remember we want to kind of rein in those, some of those emotions so that we've got an opportunity to think before we act. So as I mentioned earlier, when I'm feeling strong emotions, I try to pause. And during that moment of reflection, I ask myself a couple of questions. And the first one's kind of painful for me, but it's true. Do I really need to have my own way? And if I were to be truly honest, most of the time, that's what the root cause is, I just want my own way. So then I have to go, okay, before I respond, what's best for this relationship, for this project, for this team, for whatever it is that I'm having this conflict about. Another strategy is to make lists. Some of us like lists, and like checking things off lists. And you can, if you've got a, a, a stressful situation, something that you're not sure about, you can put the emotional arguments on one side and the rational arguments on the other. Who says that every decision needs to be either an emotional one or a rational one? Maybe it's a combination of both to consider, but we're kind of blindsided if we don't consider the other side. And then finally, you can learn to manage your self-talk. And this is another one that I'm actively working on. I was surprised to find out that the average person has 50,000 thoughts every single day. And each of those thoughts triggers that chemical reaction in your body so that we get those emotions. So if I've made a mistake or something didn't go as I had hoped it would go, I'll finish giving a present, ah, oh, bomb that one, and I start picking myself apart and I should have, could have. And I end up in this very nasty, dark place. And I've learned to go, well, it's good. Now you're going to be crabby the rest of the day. Who wants to be around you? I can make a choice. I can reframe that I'm worthless, I'm stupid, I'm whatever it is. Those negative words and say, I didn't do as well as I wanted to. Reflecting on it and going, okay, what do I want for an outcome? And what can I do to get there? a lot more positive and a lot more constructive. Another strategy that I'd like to talk about is deep breathing exercises. And I got this one from our Wellbeing Mindful Living website. Again, a little bit of chemistry or biology since my background's in nursing, I like to think about how our bodies work. And when we're stressed, it activates our sympathetic nervous system. 
heart rate goes up, our breathing gets faster, but it's shallower, which means we get less oxygen to the brain. Pupils dilate, blood pressure goes up. We're ready for that fight or flight kind of. That's our reptile brain, right? Contrast, the parasympathetic nervous system calms you down, drops your heart rate, drops your blood pressure. It's in a relaxed state. When we do deep breathing, we stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system. It helps us relax. And again, it opens up our perception in a more positive way. So when we do a little belly breathing, we stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system rather than our usual routine chest breathing. And it's very simple to do, and I'm gonna challenge you to give it a try. I'll ask you to breathe in through your nose, expand your tummy, nobody's looking, like you're blowing up a balloon. Hold it for about five to seven seconds. Breathe out through your mouth like you're blowing out that balloon. Ready to give it a try? In through the nose. Hold for five seconds. Breathe out through the mouth. Repeat that a few times. You're gonna get better oxygen to your brain. You're gonna drop your heart rate. It calms and soothes you. And now you're ready to go back to that difficult project that you're working on. You're refreshed and ready to go. I see in the chat that Chelsea says she does this every day. I think I need to start doing this too because this is the second time Deb and I have given this presentation and I've done this breathing exercise with her both times and both times I feel much more relaxed for the second half of the presentation. So uh, note to self, Stacey, I need to do this as well. Something so simple that relaxes you. Yeah, I love it. All right, so social awareness. You guys already nailed it. You have a good idea what social awareness is. It's stepping back from your own emotions and seeing what's going around, going on with others, being aware of the emotions of others. I like to think of those horses that you take on trail rides, you know, and they have those blinders on so that the horse, you know, just looks at the trail ahead and doesn't see maybe a tasty stream that's over to the right. You know, social awareness is taking those blinders off and go, oh, wow. Who knew there was a whole room full of people here with me? It's, it's not just all about me, right? There's other people here. That's social awareness. For those of you who are fans of the TV show, The Big Bang Theory, I think you probably agree with me that Sheldon Cooper is pretty funny to watch on TV, but most of us probably won't choose someone like that for a friend. Someone who is so unconcerned with everybody else's emotions would probably not be the person we would choose to spend time with, right? So let's do a little thought exercise. Think of somebody you know, you know, a family member or a friend or a coworker, and just to yourself, try to list five things that are important to them or five things that motivate them. So pick somebody in a neuro mind, try to think of five things that are important to them or that motivate them. Was it easy? I'll be honest for myself, it wasn't. Every time I practice this talk or give this talk, I try to pick somebody else and I can usually get three pretty easily. And then I have to stop and think and go, oh, hmm. You know, this, this can be hard for us. We don't always think about that. And obviously it would be even harder for people that we don't know as well. But like any of the things we're talking about today, practicing will increase our abilities to do this and practicing social awareness will increase our understanding of other people. So let's go through a few strategies for increasing our social awareness. The first thing we can do to increase our social awareness is we can practice reading the room. So think of yourself as an anthropologist. You're a scientist who studies people and their cultures. You're trying to figure out what makes them tick. If you want to use this at your next meeting and you're trying to like read the room in your meeting and see like, hmm, who's paying attention, who's upset, who's not, you can try it there. If you want a safe place to try this, it sounds a little silly, but a lot of people practice um, their social awareness by studying actors. So 
the next time you watch a TV show or watch a movie, or maybe just watch a scene from a movie, for instance, um, don't watch it for the content, but watch the actors and pay attention to how they're conveying what they're feeling, right? So not only what they're saying, but what's their tone of voice? What's their posture? You know, are they engaged? Are they leaning in? Are they leaning away? Um, what's their body language? Are their arms crossed? All those sorts of things. And again, it sounds a little silly, but that's kind of a nice, safe way to practice reading the room, just looking for those nonverbal cues, listening to the tone of voice, et cetera, looking beyond just the spoken words. What else can we do? I think a few of you had this written on the slide when we talked about social awareness. You had written down listening. We can practice our active listening skills. Deb and I have given quite a few talks about um, communication. And when we do, we almost always talk about active listening. So we won't dive in deep to active listening during this session. But just to hit the highlights, active listening is about being present in that conversation, in the moment, present, without judging. You know, I'm really trying to hear what they have to say without judging it and without thinking about what I'm going to say as a comeback or, you know, just waiting for my turn to jump in. I'm truly trying to be present, hear what they're saying. How can you do that? First of all, make sure that the time is right. You know, is now a good time to talk? You don't want to do it when you're both really heated, for instance. Um, when you're having this conversation, you want to ensure that you're understanding them correctly. Because again, you're trying to hear, the, hear what they're saying with words, but also what they're saying with nonverbal. So you want to make sure that you're interpreting correctly. And one way you can make sure that the interpretation is correct is by saying it back to them. So not with the exact same words, no, nobody wants to talk to a parrot, um, but paraphrase back to them what you heard or, or summarize it back. You know, I heard you saying, when this happens, you feel this. And if you are not interpreting them correctly, they can then correct you. And then as I've mentioned, you're also looking for what's unsaid. You're looking for that body language, listening for the tone of voice, et cetera. So that's your second strategy for social awareness. How about a third? Your third strategy is cultivating empathy. You know, that ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. If I were them, how would I feel? I think right now on this like extremely bitter day in Rochester, Minnesota, I would be pretty happy if I were this little kid jumping in a puddle <laughs> because it's warm and it looks like a lot of fun. I think for me at least, before I was working on putting this talk together with Deb, I always thought of empathy as a kind of you have it or you don't sort of a thing. I didn't really think about being able to increase my empathy. So how can we increase our empathy? It really comes down to being curious about others. You know, Try to see things from other people's perspectives or look for things that you have in common with people who are different from you. Um, you know, do you have anything, do you have a common goal? Do you have anything similar in your families? Do you have a, a hobby that you share? You could also try some aspect of a lifestyle that's not that you're not used to. You could go to a different worship service. You could read a biography of someone who's lived a very different life than you have or watch a biopic about them. Anything you can do to experience things from another perspective will help you cultivate empathy. You, know, you could travel to a new area and not just, you know, like eat at the Hard Rock Cafe, but also <laughs> see what the locals do in that area and try to experience things as the locals do. One of my favorite trips I took with a friend, um, we went to Lake of the Ozarks and the funnest thing we did was we saw a softball game going on. And so, so we stopped and watched a local softball game and just picked a team and cheered for it. And then we went to a local bar and played pool against the owner. Um, not saying that necessarily increased my empathy, but like, you know, th that's kind of the idea is, you know, trying to experience things um, from somebody else's point of view or from somebody else's location in this case. Uh, there's a Mark Twain quote that I love that says, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. You know, by experiencing other things, we'll increase our empathy. And talking about empathy very naturally leads us into a chemistry lesson, right? Oh, shoot. What is a periodic table doing in an emotional intelligence talk? <laughs> Just wanted to make sure you were still with us. I'm a chemist by training, and it gives me a little laugh to fit in some chemistry whenever I can. So why is this in here? I think we've probably all heard of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. However, 
have we heard of the platinum rule? Um, I had not. When we talk about emotional intelligence, we maybe want to think about raising that bar a little bit from gold to platinum. The platinum rule is treating others as they would like to be treated. So I'm no longer assuming that Deb wants to be treated the same way I want to be treated. So I want to treat her as she would like to be treated. That's the platinum rule. And speaking of Deb, I'll hand it back to her. Uh, so we come to our fourth competency in EI, managing relationships. And people that have high emotional intelligence are very socially aware. And as Stacy said, they can read the room. They can get a sense of who's happy, who's not, and they can respond appropriately. I wanna ask you to think about it for a moment. How, how do you feel about relationships? I'm sure there's some in this group that your relationships are as important as breathing. You've got your work friends, you've got your social friends for your volleyball team or your soccer team or the kids' dance group or whatever. You have lots and lots of great network of friends and family. People are important to you and you're lucky. That is great. You've got a great network of folks that can help you when you're feeling stressed and they can help you get things done. Research shows that teams that have a greater sense of camaraderie actually are higher functioning. And as I mentioned in the stress management slide, relationships have a positive impact on your health and well-being. But some of us, eh, I, I've, I've been known to say I only need a few friends, or it's you know I'm here to do the work. I'm not here to be the social butterfly, or all sorts of excuses. Not everybody relationships come easily to you or that it's very comfortable. And perhaps some of you have been burned by relationships where you've put yourself out there and it didn't go well. And our message for you today is give it a try. Most of us have good hearts and we want to have good relationships. And you will have the ability to kind of choose how uh, involved those relationships are but they are worthwhile. So the next thing I wanna talk about is some strategies to help us build those relationships. And the first is self-disclosure. And when we disclose something about ourselves, the other person sees us as a little more trustworthy. Remember that little voice in my head? I fill up the blank spaces with things that I guess and, and assume about you. This is the DeHardy window model, and it was created by the psychologists Joseph Lust and Harry Ingram. And they used it to describe the various stages of awareness that exist when we communicate with one another. Similar to emotional intelligence, there are four quadrants to it. The first two are all about me, my self-image, and the other two are about you or the public's image. So I'll, I'll talk about each of the four quadrants, starting with the arena. This is what I know about me and I've shared it with you. And it's green because this is where we want to live and breathe. And this should be the biggest segment. Because again, when we disclose, we seem more trustful. People get a sense of who we are. And like Stacy talked earlier, can help build empathy, even if we don't, um, come from similar backgrounds, can we find some things in common to build that relationship on? On the other side of my self-image are my blind spots. These are the things that you know about me, but I don't. And so if I want to increase my arena, I'm going to have to take that risk, like Stacy talked about earlier, asking for feedback. And hopefully you will be honest with me and let me know where my opportunities to grow are. The next quadrant is the facade. This is what I know, but you don't. And some things I choose not to share with you. We don't have to share everything. You know, it's, it's personal choice what you share. But we have to realize what the risk is. If we share minimally, people will fill it in and um, it may or may not be in a positive light. And you'll be perceived as perhaps um, 
sneaky or not trustworthy or they don't say much about themselves. So I don't know about them. Maybe they've all have that little story that they've got kind of a questionable past and maybe they're not a good trustworthy person. So if we want to decrease the facade, we'll increase that arena. And the fourth quadrant is the unknown. Hopefully that's in reality the smallest because what you don't know and what I don't know is probably a very small segment. So again, our goal is to work on increasing the size of the arena by self-disclosing, asking for feedback, and sharing with one another. A second strategy to improve our relationships is to acknowledge the feelings of other people. And Stacy talked about this when she talked about having empathy for others. Because when we do it, it gives the person a sense of safety. You know, think about it. Uh, when, when was the time when somebody really listened to you? And how did that feel? Did you trust them a little bit more? Because you felt listened to, you felt that they cared about you. That's one terrific way to build relationships. And Stacy gave a very nice description of how we can have that empathy and use that active listening skill to let that individual know that we're listening, we care about them, and we can certainly use reflection to share back what we're hearing, first to clarify, but sometimes it also gives that individual insights to perhaps a blind spot that they had. Is that what I really said? Ooh. And hearing myself talk about it out loud, it's like, ooh, I guess there is an opportunity for me to do better. Managing your relationships includes the basics. As Stacy said, we can't have a talk without saying something about effective communication. Um, conflict management. Because when, when emotions get high, people are gonna go oftentimes to one route or the other. They're gonna give in to their strong emotions, their anger, frustration, whatever, and act out. Or they'll avoid it completely because they just really don't know how to handle it and you know they're not feeling prepared. And then of course, what happens? Does that solve the problem? No, it sits there and festers and gets worse because the other person may even be oblivious to why you're upset. They just know you're upset. So here's a couple strategies you can do, use to manage conflict. First, again, on your part, stop giving mixed signals. We all know what Minnesota nice is and it, on the outside, it seems like the right thing to do. But the reality is if we really don't feel that way, we should be genuine with one another. And if there's a conflict, then let's talk about it and resolve it. So again, it doesn't fester. So rather than saying, yeah, that's fine with me, but my tone is such that it probably isn't, now we're left feeling confused. And the second piece is respect and recognize those feelings of other people, even if you don't agree with them. We can still be respectful. And, and as was mentioned earlier, don't dismiss somebody else's feelings. Their feelings are their feelings. They're entitled to feel however they want to. Don't try to change them or minimize them. They're sharing with you, this is what I feel, this is what I'm experiencing. Just listen. Just by listening and acknowledging them doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have different feelings. That's okay. Another strategy that we can use is to forge bonds with one another through our positive conversations. Have you ever had this happen to you? Hey, Stacy. I get to go to the beach for a week and lay in the sun. I can't wait. I'm leaving tomorrow. You're going on a vacation again? Do you ever work? How much PTO do you get? Gee, thanks, Stacy. Now, if this was a one-off, Stacy's a good soul. You know, she just did that for our demonstration purposes today. And if it was a one-off, I probably wouldn't be a big deal. But if that was her routine tone, when I share some good news, I'd probably get that arena smaller and quit disclosing because it didn't feel good. I had this energy and excitement and then she just blew out my balloon. 
So what's that going to do with our long-term relationship? If I shrink the arena, don't self-disclose, you know, and I might start avoiding her even or not engaging. So that can have a very negative effect. So when someone has some good news to share, we're recommending that you be active, that you make eye contact rather than just keep doing your thing. You know, acknowledge it, take a moment and pause it. Woohoo, good for you. And admit, okay, I'm a little jealous. I wish I could go with you. But be positive and be constructive. Anything else is really going to be to the detriment of that relationship. All right, as we near the top of the hour here, we have covered all four areas of emotional intelligence. And I wanna reiterate the challenge I gave you earlier that we take this session beyond today. You know, if you think about the different strategies we talked about, I think most of us will agree that none of these strategies are groundbreaking things we would have never ever thought of in our lives. Like most of them are pretty common sense things that, yeah, if I would have thought about these, I would have come up with some of these ideas on my own. So I, I think the value of something like this isn't that you listen to Deb and I talk about this, the value would be for all of us to challenge ourselves that, okay, I'm gonna work on one of these using one of these strategies or another strategy you find somewhere else. But the value would be to actually put this into practice now. So let's test it out and let's raise our emotional intelligence bar. So again, I encourage us each to find an area we're going to work on and then practice it. So maybe we're gonna give ourselves a goal of, you know, this week I'm going to work on this, or for the next month, I'm going to work on that using one strategy or two strategies, but make sure we practice it because it is something that will take practice. It won't just come immediately. And then, you know, Deb talked a little bit about self-care and just keep in mind that you really can't manage your emotions if we're not taking care of ourselves. So make sure that you do have self-care on your radar as well. I like this quote by Daniel Goleman. He's an expert in the field of emotional intelligence. Um, he summarizes the four competencies really nicely, but I'm just gonna turn his quote around a little bit for us. If your emotional abilities are in hand, and if you have self-awareness, if you're able to manage distressing emotions, if you can have empathy and have effective relationships, you are going to get far. I feel like I should quote Dr. Seuss here and say, oh, the places you'll go. So hopefully by practicing our EI, it will help us get far. Thank you for participating. Please click the button below to complete the evaluation and obtain credit.